Games of 94. Uh, we have uh, a very special guest on. I'm very happy to talk with David. Uh, again, I'm going to introduce you to this man, give a little bit of bio, background, what he's all about. So full name, David Perret. Uh, he's an active duty Marine and have realized that service members and the working class use the phrase, I don't get paid enough uh, entirely too often. So the reality is that most of our financial situation is self-inflicted. After having success with real estate investing, he started from military to millionaire to reach personal finance and real estate investing to service members and the working class. Uh, as a result, he helped many of his readers increase their savings gap, purchase real estate and increase their chances for financial freedom. So all of that sounds really great. So I really appreciate you being here on the show today, David. Well, thanks for having me, brother. I'm excited. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, it's good. Like good to have you on. And again, um, still active duty Marine. So even though I'm not from States, but thank you for the service and uh, Thanks for the support. Yeah. And uh, you know, can you just tell your background? Because again, you're coming from like completely different kind of place, you know, being a Marine servicing. So we're talking about kind of real estate business right now. And can you talk about your personal transition and how do you have you discovered real estate investing? Yeah, in 2015, I was a recruiter for the Marine Corps and a friend of mine was actually trying to get me into another business like uh, Amway, basically like a multi-level marketing. And he was trying to get me into that business and he was like, hey, you should check out this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. No, like, yeah, I don't really like to read and I don't have a whole lot of free time. And so he handed me, uh, he had it on a CD as well. And he handed me the CD and was like, well, you're in your car a lot, a lot for work. So just listen to it while you drive. And that kind of started my, I guess, my craze with audiobooks. But yeah, I listened to the book. By the end of the book, I was convinced, okay, well, I had thought about buying a house before, but now I am way more convinced of why I should be doing that. And at the same time, my lease on my apartment was coming up uh, on being due. And so I was like, well, I could either renew this lease for $550 a month, or I can look for a house. And I found a house that was uh, I think it was like $615 a month for me to own the house, but it was a duplex so I could rent out the other side. And so I went from paying like $550 a month to only paying like $150 a month out of pocket to own the place. And, you know, and that's including utilities and everything. And I was kind of hooked. Um, I was starting to read a lot more books, did some networking, and then it just slowly grew from there. And then uh, about about two years later, I just kind of started writing about it on the internet, just telling people like, oh yeah, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm learning. And I don't know, something stuck and people liked it. And it just kind of grew from there. That is very interesting. So, I mean, coming across like this, you know, Amway business and kind of people handing you the book, you know, the pink book of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm sure a lot of you who are watching read the book. If you didn't, uh, make sure you read it. But uh, you know, why, like, because again, Rich Dad Poor Dad book, he, he doesn't actually talk about, you know, investing, real estate. He just kind of talks about the mindset a little bit more. But like, how you, have you discovered that you need to follow through, you know, on the real estate path? Well, I guess it just kind of opened the door. It's more of a mindset book, as you alluded to, talks about kind of how to think through cash flow and, and investing. And so I read that book and then that opened the door to, I think cash flow quadrant, and then that opened the door to maybe ABCs of real estate. I kind of read just a few of their books on Audible. And then at the same time, I was asking questions because, like I said, about a year prior, I had maybe a year and a half prior, I had thought about buying a house, and I just didn't. Right, like I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I met with a realtor like once, and I think if I'd had a really good realtor, I probably would have gone through with it. But I don't think he was super interested in talking to me about buying like an investment type property. Um, and so it just, you know, I never, I never met with the guy again. I didn't fall through with it. I just went with the easy thing of getting an apartment. And so I kind of had the interest there already. And as I started realizing or, or re researching these different ways to do cash flow, I found bigger pockets, big, huge real estate website. You know, I'd be answering, asking questions and bigger pockets would pop up. And so I finally just decided to start asking the questions on bigger pockets. And then I got some of their books. And then I mean, this all happened within like a two month period. And I bought the house like three or four months after reading the first book. Um, it was just very convincing. Like, man, all these things make sense. I thought about buying a house anyway. The timing's good. You know, let's see what happens. 
Got it, got it. Makes sense, definitely. So can you talk about your first deal and kind of your first experience with real estate? Yeah, my first deal was that house hack. So I bought yeah. uh, a duplex. I lived in one half. I rented the other half. And then about six months later, I got stationed uh, not only out of state, but in Hawaii. So across an ocean and I had to rent the whole thing out. And so I got to go through the process of, you know, being a, a landlord while living in a house. But I, more importantly, I got to go through the process of hiring a property manager and I had to hire a property manager because I was moving. Well, You don't have to, but I recommend that if you're not going to live in the state, it's probably best to have a property manager. I personally will never go back to managing my own properties because it's just, you might make a few dollars more, but the stress is just not worth it to me. And so, you know, I hired a property manager and then I got to become familiar with uh, being out of state owning property. And it just kind of opened my door, the door to me being able to like, oh man, this really makes sense because once I was able to rent out both sides of that duplex, I was no longer paying any money. In fact, it was paying me, you know, 300 bucks a month consistently. I only paid, I did an FHA loan. So it was three and a half percent down to buy the house. And then about a thousand bucks worth of stuff done to like the floor and some, some interior stuff to just kind of touch it up. So I probably was in the house for about $4,000 total, maybe, maybe not even that. And this thing was renting for 3,600 a month. So I was getting almost every penny I'd put into it back every year, you know, and with almost no work because it was managed by a property manager. So it's just very eye opening for me that like, man, this, this thing's paying me. If I could buy, you know, if I had 10 or 20 of these, I'd be doing okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. So I, again, it's a little bit funny what you said, as you mentioned, uh, I don't want to manage my own property, you know, being a, a property manager, because it's too stressful for me, even though you're an active duty Marine. So I think you can handle th that type of stress. But, uh, you know, how, like you mentioned that uh, people kind of tell you a lot, like, I, I don't get paid enough. And, you know, kind of having this self inflicted, you know, financial, you know, like, all these problems that you come across, like people complaining about, I'm not making enough, like there is no money, like even though, cause it's crazy because I'm from Europe and I know there's some people watching from, from Europe, from USA, like US is a little bit of like capitalistic country. So I, I guess people talk about money a little bit more than in Europe, but uh, like, why have you decided to, you know, start educating people about money, even though like in the States, there's already, I think a lot, a lot of people talking about that topic. Well, I made a really bunch, a bunch of really bad decisions when I first got into uh, life as an adult. Uh, my parents were frugal. My parents, you know, we weren't wealthy, but they were good with money. And I, I think I took that when I joined the military. I was like, oh my gosh, I got my own paycheck. Look at all this stuff I can buy. And then I, I bought it all. Uh, I had, you know, cars and Harleys and and, tat and tattoos and motorcycles and guns and uh, expensive dates and and expensive. Uh, beverage purchases and, uh, you know, tons and tons of alcohol when I was in Japan and I was, you know, legally able to drink at a younger age. And um, I, I mean, I made a substantial amount of money the first two, three, four years I was in the military and had a, basically nothing to show for it other than like a rifle, an old truck and a motorcycle that wasn't paid off. And so when I, you know, people especially in the military, there's like this culture that's kind of like, you know, Hey, we don't, we don't get paid enough. Like that's, that's the thing in the military is talking about how they don't get paid enough. And the military likes to think that they don't make any money and they like to kind of play. It's like this victim mentality, but the reality is we actually get paid really well. It's just that not all of our income is taxed. So it doesn't all show up on your W2. So it's actually more beneficial. Um, and I'm a prime example. I blew all my money because I was convinced I didn't make any. So I just spent it all and, and self-inflicted, you know, destroyed my finances and had all kinds of debt, and no, nothing to show for myself. And so I just try to help service members realize like, look, man, too many veterans and, and people in general get to retirement age and they, they can't retire. They take another job and then they take another job and then they, you know, they're basically like a slave to the workforce for their entire life. And so my goal is to just help, you know, as many people as possible realize like, look, dude, you can, even if you just work a normal job, if you're smart with your money, when it comes time to retire, you can actually retire. Your kids aren't going to be taking care of you and like, you're going to be okay. Right. And 
I don't know. I, I kind of just decided, well, if I'm going to be learning all this stuff, I might as well talk about it so other people can learn it. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So kind of, kind of like, what is one advice that you gave uh, that you like giving out most often, you know, to the people when you come across, you know, these uh, people complaining, you know, there is no money around them having all these problems. So what, what advice you give to those people? Uh, the first thing is that the income is almost never the problem. It's always your expenses, right? So it, you know, don't buy a brand new car. It's like the worst thing you could ever buy because it loses all its value or, or 50 to 60% of its value in the first five years you own it while you're paying interest. So this thing loses 50% of its value and you've paid 10% in interest. Like, all right, well, you basically spent $100,000 for something that is worth 40, right? You know, I mean, the math is just not there. It's just not a good investment. And then things like, uh, so you, you got that, you get all the, like eating out unnecessarily and, and just, you can live your life without having to live extravagantly. So just tell people, I just basically tell people like, look, put 500 bucks, you know, start there, right. Or a thousand bucks, whatever you're comfortable with, set up an allotment, put it in a bank account and don't touch it and just let it kind of grow for a little bit and use it as a, you can put an emergency fund. You can do like, there's all these basic financial things you can do to just, in essence, just say, look, just stop spending all your money and put some of it aside before you have access to it so that you spend whatever's left and it doesn't matter because you still saved some money first. And if you can just figure out how to keep your expenses under control, especially in the military where you're going to get promoted fairly frequently, like I get a pay raise every two years. And if I get promoted, I get another pay raise. So if I can just figure out how to stay at my same level of expenses and not grow every time I get a paycheck, then inevitably I'm going to build wealth because every time I get a paycheck, I'm keeping all of that. And unfortunately too many people, you know, they just go and blow everything they have and live paycheck to paycheck. And so it's really, I mean, it's not, it's pretty easy. And then the other thing is just get around people who are decent with money. You know, if you, if you think positive thoughts with money, then you're going to, have a lot better luck than if you just sit around and say, Oh, I don't get paid anything. Like that's just not going to help anyone. So. Oh, definitely. So kind of, you know, like what I'm getting, if you just learn how to tax yourself more, what you're already taxing, if you're taxing yourself, anything. And what I mean by that, just putting money aside. So let's say if, if people putting away 20% of, uh, you know, gross income, like putting, putting maybe even more, you know, for the potential investments, because if, if the government came to you and said, hey, listen, you have to pay 20% more tax, probably most of you will scream and yell and complain by the end of the day, we'll pay that. So it, it means you, you possibly can live with a little bit more, with, with a little bit less, but, but save, uh, you know, save a little bit more at the same time. You know, for those potential investments, which I want to talk about right now, because um, like, can you just explain the, the deal criteria, like what you're currently having in the pipeline, the deals that you're looking at right now? Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing, especially for service members, I tell them like, look at your, your thrift savings plan or your 401k, right? You should, should absolutely contribute money to your tax advantaged retirement funds because those are valuable and they go up over time and they count as uh, reserves. So when you go to buy a lot of real estate, banks want to see that you have cash in reserve. Well, if you're like me, if you have $40,000 in the bank, you find somewhere to spend it, right? If, if that, that might be a nice car, that might be nice clothes, that might be food, or it could just be the next investment, but people don't generally enjoy sitting on a lot of money in their bank account. And so if you put that into a like retirement fund that you can't touch, like you're gaining a lot of interest on it, it you've got tax advantages going for you, and the bank will count that towards your uh, cash reserves. So like me, I've got enough money in my retirement account, but that counts for my cash reserves on all of my properties. And my bank is totally cool with that, but I don't have to worry about me wanting to touch it because it just sits there. And then I save the rest of my money into an account where I can invest. But as far as me personally with deals, um, I'm a buy and hold guy. Yeah. You know, I've flipped some houses. I've done some wholesale. I've done a little bit of everything, uh, but I primarily enjoy like buying and holding rental properties forever, right? Like I just kind of plan on probate death being my exit strategy where I don't have to pay a whole lot of taxes because the tax basis gets reset when you die and there's all these great benefits for your kids. And it's like, man, well, why, why pay taxes on a perfectly good home when I could just not sell it? So for the most part, that's kind of my plan. I'll probably thin the herd every now and then and get rid of the properties that aren't worth keeping around. But 
Um, but I look for anything from one to 25 units on my own and just a simple, I mean, there's some super basic things like 1%, uh, you know, of the, whatever the purchase price is, is what it should be pulling in and rent. But I actually get a little bit better than that. And essentially I, I just gotten to where I know my market well enough that I can just kind of say, yep, that works and, and go for it. But just looking for a rental property that like, for example, the one that I just bought recently was uh, like $93,000 in rents for $1,100 a month. So, you know, I've got a little bit of a buffer there. It gives me two, 300 bucks a month in cash flow, And I know that I got it a little bit under value. So I'll just hold that one for a long time and it'll go up in value. Um, currently under contract on a small portfolio. So what I'm kind of looking for right now is landlords who are either convinced that the sky is falling because of COVID and the economy, or they're just older and either way they're looking to retire from real estate. And so I'm trying to find people who have a lot of equity in their home and are not, not really wanting to stay in the real estate game so that I can talk to them about selling and, and, you know, strike a good deal for both of us. And uh, in theory, by uh, seller finance. So if I can find someone who owns the house outright, I can just say, Hey, you know, how about I just pay you that much a month rather than you having to deal with the property and I'll deal with the property. And then, you know, after a certain amount of time, I pay them off and I own the properties without a bank involved. Mm, got it. Got it. But again, I love the fact that you're a buy and hold guy and, you know, you, you, you're buying and, and looking to keep those properties for that infinite appreciation and you know, over, over all these upcoming years, uh, which of course, at, at some point, probably you had to sell some properties just to scale the business, to buy more units or whatever that there was at the time. But like, how many units do you currently own at the moment? Yeah, you know, I actually, I haven't had to sell anything yet. Well, I mean, I guess I did some some small flips. Uh, currently, uh, just me and my wife have 15 rental units right now, uh, five under contract. And then, well, that's with a friend. And then I'm a partner on a 146 unit apartment deal. And as then an LP. we bought, Yeah. Uh, no, as a general partner. A so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man, managing member. Um, not, not a huge ownership interest by any means, but small partner. So, um did some of the underwriting and stuff for that deal. And then uh, looking at some of those other deals on the multifamily side, but, and then we've bought and sold, you know, some other stuff, some, some flips. And uh, like we had a 40 unit that we did a lease option on and it just didn't work out. So we didn't execute the option and just left mm. the the deal. Um, that one was actually kind of painful. There was a lot of capital tied up in that. So, uh, and, so, and not necessarily on the best terms. So we're uh, trying to get that capital back uh, via, via court, which is just not fun uh, two years later, but. Um, okay. Yeah. So the question that I wanted to ask about the multifamily, like what is the particular reason for you personally to get involved in, in that? Uh, how, like how big is the deal? We said 150, 150 units? 146. Yeah. 146 yeah, yeah. units. So uh, you're part of a GP on that deal. So what is the reason for that? Is it, is it for the passive income, for the tax write-offs? Like how do you position on that? Honestly, the, the biggest reason for me is just to learn about syndications. I, I just wanted to learn how they work. And I had some friends who were doing some big things and I was able to get in on it and help them with uh, investor relations and some, some due diligence and some underwriting. And so it was a big learning experience for me. But I do like... So I own a 10 unit myself and I love that property. That is probably my favorite thing I've ever purchased for several reasons. Um, but economies of scale, right? Like with a multifamily, like with a large property, it, you know that if you can raise the rent by 50 bucks on every unit, then you can figure out how much that adds to the value of the property. And I, I'm more of a logical guy than an emotional guy. And I'm, I'm more of a vision guy and a numbers guy and a tangible guy. So I'm not as much of a fan of the idea of, like I like single families a lot, but I know with a single family, you do some renovations and, and you know, you got to pull comps and, and there's a very good chance you can be accurate on what the price of that home is. But like from a tangible reason I like multifamily just because I know, okay, well, if I cut a hundred dollars off the expenses, then that means at a 10% cap, I just added, you know, $1,212,000 worth of value to this property. And you can very easily go in and say, well, there's some expenses to cut out and there's some income we can get. And so the business plan for those is a lot of fun. And I enjoy kind of the strategy behind that. Um, 
not necessarily a huge fan of all the paperwork and crap that goes into all the regulations that go into it. So I would never be able to take one of those down on my own. I don't think because I would just lose my mind trying to deal with an attorney, but uh, well, it's, it was it's the right partner. Yeah, it's definitely not, not the, you know, it's not for one person to do the multifamily deals, especially, you know, that big. I mean, you can probably take a 10 unit deal as you, as you have, you know, one like yourself, but uh, yeah, 150 units like it now it's, it's just too, way too difficult. So yeah. as I understand now we have 10 units, uh, multi and five, uh, single residential properties, right? Yeah. So are you planning to kind of go, you know, to the multifamily route? Like, are you, are you planning to go deeper in the forest, you know, w w with the multifamily? What is your plan? Kind of a little of both, I think. The little portfolio I'm buying right now is a duplex and three single family homes. And then I have a phone call in about two hours with a gentleman who oh, is debating retiring from real estate and he owns 13 properties and five of those or six of those are duplexes. Um, so I, if I can convince him of the right price, I'd like to buy all of those. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, it, if it's the right price and it's in the right area in town and it's, you know, something I can hold for the long term, I'm totally open to it. But I'm also marketing on the other side, like a buddy of mine is going under contract on a bigger deal here this week and discussing with him whether or not he's going to need help with that. I, I may partner with him on it. And, you know, if so, cool. If not, whatever. Um, working, continuing to work with the same general partner team that I bought, we bought this last one in. And so kind of a little bit of both arenas, right? I can, I can manage, you know, one to 10, one to 25 unit properties on my own, but I can still be a partner on these bigger syndications because I'm not the guy doing all of the work. So for me, you know, investor relations and, and helping with underwriting and stuff is, is not anything super time consuming, at least not after closing the deal. So I'm kind of trying to balance both of those spheres, but I, I'm definitely a buy and hold guy. Uh, there's a chance you may see me doing a little bit of Airbnb in some markets just, just but that's going to be like more unique stuff, you know, like a little uh, tiny home on some land in the woods or things oh, that kind of vacation rental. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Things that are in locations I would want to visit. So nice. Nice. So, so at the end of the day, you can go and visit those places yourself when it's not booked. So just to spend some yep. time yeah, with family. That's awesome. So uh, again, talking about the multi deals and again, your maybe your personal portfolio, then 15, 15 uh, unit portfolio. What state are we talking about? Uh, the 15 is in Missouri and then the big apartment is in South Carolina. Got it. So if you're going to continue to purchase again, uh, as, as you mentioned, this, this person is coming up uh, with the, uh, like multiple duplexes that he has. So what states, what states are, are those units going to be in? Those are all in Missouri. Okay. So are you planning yeah. to invest out of state, some other countries, uh, like when it comes to your personal deals, cause I know you might be investing in it as a GP in some other states, but when it comes to your personal portfolio. Um, yeah, well, I haven't lived in Missouri in the last four years. So I suppose that's out of state, but I'm going to be moving back in about a year. Um, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, there's several other markets that I like, but the market that I'm in right now, it, it's working. It's nothing crazy, not a ton of appreciation. The whole world doesn't know it exists. And it's not like every investor and their mother is trying to move there. So I like it because it's got a little bit less competition and it's just kind of a slow and steady cash flow market, which is what I am looking for. And so I'll stay there at least for a little while. Uh, I've got another market, you know, I mean, I was born or not born, but I was grew up in Little Rock, which is about four hours, five hours south. And that's a decent market too. So, I mean, I could go invest there. Uh, there's a lot of places in the Midwest that kind of fit what I look for, right? <clears throat> like right now, uh, Oklahoma City is hot, Indianapolis, Kansas City, like the, all of these markets seem pretty solid. So you know, it just depends on if I need to move, right? If everything in that one area is working out for me. I'm going to stick there for a while. Yeah, I got it. Got it. Makes sense. So can you talk about your platform, which is from uh, military to from uh, military yeah, to millionaire? So can you talk about the platform? What are you teaching? Like, uh, is it a podcast like, or you have the YouTube? Because I know you have a multiple platforms, but kind of a little bit more in detail what, what, you're, what you're teaching people about. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, the Military Millionaire podcast is out there. We've got um, about... I don't know. I think episode like 111 just released today. So you're a little bit ahead of me. 
Just a little bit. I mean, you're pretty pretty far along, right? Most people don't make it past 20 or 30. I'll, I'll catch so. up. I'll catch up. I'm going to go past you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just do two, two a week. Uh, I only do one a week. So uh, rarely, I mean, occasionally I'll do two, but but rarely. Yes, we have the Military Millionaire Podcast. And then uh, there's a blog. There's a YouTube channel. There's a big Facebook group. And yeah, it's basically, uh, I mean, the platform itself is just... I, I market it as helping service members and veterans learn how to build wealth through through real estate investing, entrepreneurship, and personal finance. But the reality is everything I teach or talk about is applicable to people in the military, out of the military, you know, anybody with a job, whatever. It's just there's only a few like specific niche items like the VA home loan or or VA disability benefits and things like that that are, you know, veteran specific. But vast majority of what I talk about, or at least conceptually talk about is applicable to everybody out there. So um, yeah, I focus kind of on the military niche because I'm a little brash. Uh, not everybody uh, appreciates the uh, inner Marine attitude where I'm a, I can be a little bit of a uh, crude jerk sometimes, but you know what? People need that in life. And uh, yeah, it's out there where we do uh, some, some, I mean, coaching, some small course stuff, but most of what we do is just free content to get out there and help people out. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the people who are in the military is going to dig the content because they, they will relate to you, you know, pushing on them. Because again, that's that's the way the mentality works. Like I never been in the military. I always wanted to go, but due to the circumstances, I couldn't. But uh, it, it's it's a beautiful thing what you're saying because a lot of people can handle it. As you know, like you read the Rich Dad Poor Dad and he said when he came back to the Xerox to work as a salesperson, like the people uh, couldn't handle him because he was just too much for them because yep. of the military. But that's awesome. But uh, again, I love at the same time that you're building this network and again, having the YouTube, the, you know, the podcast, which you're putting out constantly frequently. And it doesn't matter if it's two, two week, one week, but I mean, you're helping a lot of people, especially when it comes to, you know, me, uh, military veterans, because the, the statistics and rates for depression and, you know, all those, uh, all those things, uh, you know, it's quite high. So having them, you know, focus in a place where they can come in and kind of feel as a back part of the family, it's a great thing, you know, so, so it's awesome. I love what you guys are doing. Awesome. So, so talking about kind of your personal goals for the upcoming year, because this, uh, this year kind of started out a little bit crazy, right? So what are you planning still to accomplish for your personal business? I know you mentioned the duplexes that you're planning to buy. So like, how long do you plan ahead and what are you, what are you looking to accomplish? Well, my biggest goal over the next year is that I plan to exit active duty and enter the reserves so that I will have the ability to go full time with this platform. And then if we're allowed to speak, I would like to get into public speaking at that point. Um, I have a book that's at the editor right now being worked on. And so I want to get that book out. That's like a basic guide to military life and finance type book. And then really just uh, we're working on a multifamily course to help people out. And I'm, I'm not the mastermind behind that. I've got two or three partners who are much better syndicators than I ever will be um, helping me out with that to make sure it's a really top notch course. It's going to be super, super cheap though, because not really in it for, that's not where I try to make money. I don't try to pedal courses towards people. Um, although I think that's a very viable business. I just, I don't personally like charging a ton of money for courses. So I figure I can give the course out for dirt cheap and then, um, you know, if people want more like one-on-one -on -one coaching and stuff, okay, well, you know, you might have to pay a little bit of money for my time or travel, but, uh, but I'm all about reaching as many people as possible. So, um, so we're working on a course, working on a book, uh, mastermind group is growing strong. And, uh, I guess those are kind of my biggest goals is just being able to exit active duty and not have to go get a job. Got it. Got it. Got it. So again, I, I, I love the the content, everything that you're putting out, you know, it, it's, it's awesome. And again, the, with business goals, I'm sure you're going to accomplish that and, and more in upcoming year. So what will be kind of the one thing, cause I know you come across like a lot of people doing these, you know, podcast episodes yourself and you've been on multiple, probably hundred podcasts, uh, just like this one before, before me. So, but what is the one thing that you always want to people to remember about you when you meet them? just that I'm genuine, right? Like I, I'm very trans transparent. I have no problem talking about mistakes that I've made. And I think that's usually what people do remember. Um, the one thing I think I, the one piece of advice I think I wish everybody would just remember is that life is super simple. You just got to like learn, network and take action. Like if you can just get around people 
you continually learn new things, you get around people who are doing what you want to do, and then you actually like get off the X and like take that first step, you'll achieve success. Most people get lost in that. They don't want to learn or they don't want to meet new people or they don't actually want to get off their butt. If you can't do those three things, like, you know, hey, you're kind of daydreaming, but uh, you can, those are very easy steps. So get out there and do something. Awesome. Awesome. Again, I love the fact that you're saying just simplifying things, uh, which is the key in life and business. So that is awesome. I mean, I, I love uh, I love the topics that we covered today. I mean, uh, there is more to that. And again, uh, I would love for you guys. I do encourage you guys and girls go and check it out. Uh, the From Military to Millionaire podcast, of course, the YouTube, all of the links are going to be down below. So it's easier for you to access those resources. Uh, David, really want to thank you for being today on the show. It's been a good fun. Uh, it was really good to meet you today and, you know, talk about how you can go from serving in the military, which there's a lot of people who are doing that currently, to building, uh, you know, a real estate business and, and going beyond that. So that's awesome. I love the advice. So guys, for you who are watching, uh, just one thing that I wanted to ask you, if you just share this message with the person and maybe with the person who is in the military, uh, I think this message would be very valuable for those people kind of give you the tips and the nuggets and the direction on uh, where they can go with their real estate business. And again, uh, they will be able to access David's uh, podcast and YouTube from here. So again, David, I appreciate you being on the show today again. Uh, so this has been an episode 94 with David Perret. Uh, thanks for watching and I'm gonna see you in the next